is brought to you by our Patreon supporters and by Luncheon Baskets. Tonight, we'll read another excerpt from The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham, published in 1908. This story centers around four small animals, mole, rat, toad, and badger. Their stories take place in the countryside of Edwardian, England. If you'd like to start with the first episode, it aired on March 22nd, 2021. Graham grew up on the River Thames. As secretary of the Bank of England, he told his son bedtime stories that evolved into this book after he took an early retirement. In the last episode, Mole was spring cleaning his underground burrow when he was hit hard by spring fever. He ran up into the sunshine and befriended a water rat on the River Thames. The mole then not only sees a river for the first time, but has his first boat ride. We will pick up at the start of their delicious picnic. get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep Leaving the main stream of the River Thames, the mole and the water rat now passed into what seemed at first sight like a little landlocked lake. Green turf sloped down to either edge. Brown, snaky tree roots gleamed below the surface of the quiet water while ahead of them, the silvery shoulder and foamy tumble of a low dam, arm in arm with a restless, dripping mill wheel, created a soft murmur. The rat brought the boat alongside the bank, made her fast, helped the still awkward mole safely ashore and swung out the luncheon basket. The mole begged as a favor to be allowed to unpack it all by himself, and the rat was very pleased to indulge him and to sprawl at full length on the grass and rest while his excited friend shook out the tablecloth and spread it, took out all the mysterious packets one by one and arranged their contents in due order, still gasping, oh my, oh my, at each fresh revelation. When all was ready, the rat said, Now, 
Pitch in, old fellow. And the mole was indeed very glad to obey, for he had started his spring cleaning at a very early hour, as people will do, and had not paused for bite or sup and he had been through a very great deal since that distant time which now seemed so many days ago. And what are you looking at? said the rat presently, when the edge of their hunger was somewhat dulled, and the mole's eyes were able to wander off the tablecloth a little. I am looking, said the mole, at a streak of bubbles that I see traveling along the surface of the water. That is a thing that strikes me as funny. Bubbles? Oh, said the rat, and chirruped cheerily in an inviting sort of way. A broad, glistening muzzle showed itself above the edge of the bank, and the otter hauled himself out and shook the water from his coat. Greedy beggars, he observed, making for the food. Why didn't you invite me, Ratty? This was an impromptu affair, explained the rat. By the way, my friend, Mr. Mole. Proud, I'm sure, said the otter, and the two animals were friends forthwith. Such a rumpus everywhere, continued the otter. All the world seems out on the river today. I came up this backwater to try and get a moment's peace and then stumble upon you fellows, at least. I beg your pardon. I don't exactly mean that, you know. There was a rustle behind them, proceeding from a hedge wherein last year's leaves still clung thick, and a stripy head with high shoulders behind it peered forth on them. Come on, old badger shouted the rat. The badger trotted forward a pace or two, then grunted, company, and turned his back and disappeared from view. That's just the sort of fellow he is, observed the disappointed rat. Simply hates society. No, we shan't see him any more today. Well, tell us, who's out on the river? Toad's out, for one, replied the otter. In his brand new wager boat, new togs, new everything. The two animals looked at each other and laughed. Once... It was nothing but sailing, said the rat. Then he tired of that and took to punting. Nothing would please him but to punt all day and every day, and a nice mess he made of it. Last year it was houseboating, and we all had to go and stay with him in his houseboat and pretend we liked it. He was going to spend the rest of his life in a houseboat. It's all the same. Whatever he takes up, he gets tired of and starts on something fresh. Such a good fellow, too, remarked the otter, reflectively, but no stability, especially in a boat. From where they sat, they could get a glimpse of the main stream across the island that separated them. And just then, a wager boat flashed into view. The rower, 
a short, stout figure, splashing badly and rolling a good deal, but working his hardest. The rat stood up and hailed him, but Toad, for it was he, shook his head and settled sternly to his work. He'll be out of the boat in a minute if he rolls like that said the rat, sitting down again. Of course he will, chuckled the otter. Did I ever tell you that good story about Toad and the lock keeper? It happened this way, Toad. An errant mayfly swerved unsteadily athwart the current in the intoxicated fashion affected by young bloods of mayflies seeing life. A swirl of water and a cloop, and the mayfly was visible no more. Neither was the otter. The mole looked down. The voice was still in his ears, but the turf whereon he had sprawled was clearly vacant. Not an otter to be seen as far as the distant horizon. But again, there was a streak of bubbles on the surface of the river. The rat hummed a tune and the mole recollected that animal etiquette forbade any sort of comment on the sudden disappearance of one's friends at any moment, for any reason, or no reason whatever. Well, well, said the rat, I suppose we ought to be moving. I wonder which of us had better pack the luncheon basket. He did not speak as if he was eager for the treat. Oh, please let me do it, said the mole. So, of course, the rat let him. Packing the basket was not quite such pleasant work as unpacking the basket It never is. But the mole was bent on enjoying everything. And although just when he had got the basket packed and strapped up tightly, he saw a plate staring up at him from the grass. And when the job had been done again, the rat pointed out a fork, which anybody ought to have seen. And last of all, behold, the mustard pot, which he had been sitting on without knowing it. Still, somehow, the thing got finished at last, without much loss of temper. The afternoon sun was getting low as the rat sculled gently homewards in a dreamy mood, murmuring poetry things over to himself and not paying much attention to the mole. But mole was very full of lunch and self-satisfaction and pride and already quite at home in a boat, so he thought, and was getting a bit restless besides. And presently he said, Ratty, please, I want to row now. The rat shook his head with a smile. Not yet, my young friend, he said. Wait till you have had a few lessons. It's not so easy as it looks. The mole was quiet 
for a minute or two. But he began to feel more and more jealous of Rat, sculling so strongly and so easily along. And his pride began to whisper that he could do it every bit as well. He jumped up and seized the skulls so suddenly that the rat, who was gazing out over the water and saying more poetry things to himself, was taken by surprise and fell backwards off his seat with his legs in the air for the second time, while the triumphant mole took his place and grabbed the skulls with entire confidence. Stop it, silly, cried the rat from the bottom of the boat. You can't do it. You have us over. The mole flung his skulls back with a flourish and made a great dig at the water. He missed the surface altogether. His legs flew up above his head, and he found himself lying on top of the prostrate rat. Greatly alarmed, he made a grab at the side of the boat, and the next moment, splush, over went the boat, and he found himself struggling in the river. Oh my, how cold the water was. And oh, how very wet it felt. How it sang in his ears as he went down, down, down. How bright and welcome the sun looked as he rose to the surface, coughing and spluttering. How black was his despair when he felt himself sinking again. Then a firm paw gripped him by the back of his neck. It was the rat, and he was evidently laughing. The mole could feel him laughing right down his arm and through his paw, and so into his, the mole's neck. The rat caught hold of the skull and shoved it under the mole's arm. Then he did the same by the other side of him and, swimming behind, propelled the helpless animal to shore, hauled him out, and sat him down on the bank, a squashy, pulpy lump of misery. When the rat had rubbed him down a bit and wrung some of the wet out of him, he said, Now then, old fellow, trot up and down the towing path as hard as you can till you're warm and dry again while I dive for the luncheon basket. So the dismal mole, wet without, and ashamed within, trotted about till he was fairly dry, while the rat plunged into the water again, recovered the boat, righted her, and made her fast, fetched his floating property to shore by degrees, and finally dived successfully for the luncheon basket and struggle to land with it. When all was ready for a start once more, the mole, limp and dejected, took his seat in the stern of the boat, and as they set off, he said in a low voice, 
broken with emotion. Ratty, my generous friend, I'm very sorry indeed for my foolish and ungrateful conduct. My heart quite fails me when I think I might have lost that beautiful luncheon basket. Indeed, I've been a complete ass, and I know it. Will you overlook at this once and forgive me, and let things go on as before? That's all right, bless you, responded the rat cheerily. What's a little wet in a water rat? I'm more in the water than out of it these days. Don't you think about it any more. And look here, I really think you had better come and stop with me for a little time. It's very plain and rough, you know, not like Toad's house at all. But you haven't seen that yet. Still, I can make you comfortable. And I'll teach you to row and to swim. And you'll soon be as handy on the water as any of us. The mole was so touched by his kind manner of speaking that he could find no voice to answer him and he had to brush away a tear or two with the back of his paw. But the rat kindly looked in another direction, and presently the mole's spirits revived again, and he was able to give some straight back talk to a couple of moorhens who were sniggering to each other about his bedraggled appearance. When they got home, the rat made a bright fire in the parlor and planted the mole in an armchair in front of it, having fetched down a dressing gown and slippers for him and told him river stories till supper time. Very thrilling stories they were, too to an earth animal, like Mole. Stories about sudden floods and leaping pike and steamers that flung hard bottles. At least, bottles were certainly flung and from steamers, so presumably by them. And about herons and how particular they were whom they spoke to, and about adventures down drains, and night fishings with otter, or excursions far afield with badger. Supper was a most cheerful meal, But very shortly afterwards, a terribly sleepy mole had to be escorted upstairs by his considerate host to the best bedroom, where he soon laid his head on his pillow in great peace and contentment, knowing that his new found friend, the river, was lapping the sill of his window. This day was only the first of many similar ones for the emancipated mole, each of them longer and full of interest as the ripening summer moved onward. He learnt to swim and to row and entered into the joy of running water. And with his ear to the reed stems he caught, at intervals, something of what the wind went whispering so constantly among them. The Open Road Ratty, 
said the mole, suddenly, one bright summer morning. If you please, I want to ask you a favor. The rat was sitting on the riverbank, singing a little song. He had just composed it himself, so he was very taken up with it and would not pay proper attention to mole or anything else. Since early morning, he had been swimming in the river in company with his friends, the ducks. And when the ducks stood on their heads suddenly, as ducks will, he would dive down and tickle their necks just under where their chins would be if ducks had chins till they were forced to come to the surface again in a hurry, spluttering and angry and shaking their feathers at him, for it is impossible to say quite all you feel when your head is underwater. At last they implored him to go away and attend to his own affairs, and leave them to mind theirs. So the rat went away and sat on the river bank in the sun and made up a song about them, which he called Duck's Ditty. Here are the lyrics. All along the backwater, Through the rushes tall, ducks are dabbling up tails all. Ducks' tails, drakes' tails, yellow feet a quiver, yellow bills all out of sight, busy in the river. Slushy green undergrowth where the roach swim. Here we keep our larder, cool and full and dim. Everyone for what he likes, we like to be. Heads down, tails up, dabbling free. High in the blue above, swifts whirl and call. We are down a dabbling, up tails all. I don't know that I think so very much of that little song, Rat, observed the mole cautiously. He was no poet himself and didn't care who knew it, and he had a candid nature nor don't the ducks neither, replied the rat cheerfully. They say, why can't fellows be allowed to do what they like when they like and as they like, instead of other fellows sitting on the banks and watching them all the time and making remarks and poetry and things about them? What nonsense it all is. That's what the ducks say. So it is, so it is, said the mole with great heartiness. No, it isn't, cried the rat indignantly. Well, then, it isn't, it isn't, replied the mole soothingly. But what I wanted to ask you was, Won't you take me to call on Mr. Toad? I've heard so much about him, and I do so want to make his acquaintance. Why, certainly, said the good-natured rat, jumping to his feet 
and dismissing poetry from his mind for the day. Get the boat out, and we'll paddle up there at once. It's never the wrong time to call on the toad. Early or late, he's always the same fellow, always good-natured, always glad to see you, always sorry when you go. He must be a very nice animal, observed the mole as he got into the boat and took the skulls while the rat settled himself comfortably in the stern. He is indeed the best of animals, replied Rat. So simple, so good-natured, and so affectionate. Perhaps he's not very clever. We can't all be geniuses. And it may be that he's both boastful and conceited. But he's got some great qualities, says Toady. Rounding a bend in the river, they came in sight of a handsome, dignified old house of mellowed red brick with well-kept lawns reaching down to the water's edge. There's Toad Hall, said the rat, and that creek on the left where the notice board says private, no landing allowed, leads to his boathouse where we'll leave the boat. The stables are over there to the right. That's the banqueting hall you're looking at now. Very old, that is. Toad is rather rich, you know, and this is really one of the nicest houses in these parts, though we never admit as much to Toad. They glided up the creek and the mole shipped his skulls as they passed into the shadow of a large boat house. Here they saw many handsome boats slung from the cross beams or hauled up on a slip, but none in the water and the place had an unused and deserted air. The rat looked around him. I understand, said he. Boating is played out. He's tired of it and done with it. I wonder what new fad he's taken up now. Come along, let's look him up. We shall hear about it quite soon enough. They disembarked and strolled across the happy flower-decked lawns in search of Toad, whom they presently happened upon resting in a wicker garden chair with a preoccupied expression on his face and a large map spread out on his knees. Hooray, he cried, jumping up on seeing them. This is splendid. He shook the paws of both of them warmly, never waiting for an introduction to the mole. How kind of you, he went on, dancing round them. I was just going to send a boat down the river for you, Ratty, with strict orders that you were to be fetched up here at once, whatever you were doing. I want you badly, both of you. Now what will you take? Come inside and have something. You don't know how lucky it is. You're turning up just now. Let's sit here quite a bit, 
Be quiet, Toady, said the rat, throwing himself into an easy chair while the mole took another by the side of him and made some civil remark about Toad's delightful residence. Finest house on the whole river, cried Toad boisterously, or anywhere else for that matter. He could not help adding. Here, the rat nudged the mole. Unfortunately, the toad saw him do it and turned very red. There was a moment's painful silence. Then toad burst out laughing. All right, ratty, he said. It's only my way, you know. And it's not such a very bad house, is it? You know you rather like it yourself. Now, look here. Let's be sensible. You are the very animals I wanted. You've got to help me. It's most important. It's about your rowing, I suppose, said the rat with an innocent air. You're getting fairly well, though you still splash a good bit. With a great deal of patience and any quantity of coaching, you may... Oh, poo, boating, interrupted the toad in great disgust. Silly boyish amusement. I've given that up long ago. Sheer waste of time, that's what it is. It makes me downright sorry to see you fellows, who ought to know better, spending all of your energies in that aimless manner. No, I've discovered the real thing, the only genuine occupation for a lifetime. I propose to devote the remainder of mine to it and can only regret the wasted years that lie behind me, squandered in trivialities. Come with me, dear Ratty, and your amiable friend too, if he will be so very good, just as far as the stable yard, and you shall see what you shall see. He led the way to the stable yard accordingly, the rat following with a most mistrustful expression. And there, drawn out of the coach house into the open, they saw a gypsy caravan, shining with newness, painted a canary yellow, picked out with green and red wheels. There you are, cried the toad, straddling and expanding himself. There's real life for you embodied in that little cart. The open road, the dusty highway, the heath, the common, the hedgerows, the rolling downs, camps, villages, towns, cities. Here today, up and off to somewhere else tomorrow. Travel, change, interest, excitement. The whole world before you and a horizon that's always changing. And mind, this is the very finest cart of its sort 
that was ever built, without any exception. Come inside and look at the arrangements. Planned them all myself, I did. The mole was tremendously interested and excited and followed him eagerly up the steps and into the interior of the caravan. The rat only snorted and thrust his hands deep into his pockets, remaining where he was. It was indeed very compact and comfortable. Little sleeping bunks, a little table that folded up against the wall, a cooking stove, walkers, bookshelves, a birdcage with a bird in it, and pots, pans, jugs, and kettles of every size and variety, all complete, said the toad triumphantly, pulling open a locker. You see, biscuits, potted lobster, sardines, everything you can possibly want. Soda water, letter paper, bacon, jam, cards and dominoes. You'll find it, he continued, as they descended the steps again. You'll find that nothing whatever ever has been forgotten when we make our start this afternoon. I beg your pardon, said the rat, slowly, as he chewed a straw. But did I hear you say something about we and start and this afternoon. Now, you dear good old ratty, said Toad, imploringly, don't begin talking in that stiff and sniffy sort of way, because you know you've got to come. I can't possibly manage without you, so please consider it settled, and don't argue. It's the one thing I can't stand. You surely don't mean to stick to your dull, fusty old river all your life and just live in a hole in a bank and boat? I want to show you the world. I'm going to make an animal of you, my boy. I don't care, said the rat, doggedly. I'm not coming, and that's flat, and I am going to stick to my old river and live in a hole and boat, as I've always done. And what's more, Mo's going to stick with me and do as I do, aren't you, Mo? Of course I am, said the mole, loyally. I'll always stick to you, Rat. And what you say is to be, has got to be, all the same. It sounds as it might have been, well, rather fun, you know. Added the mole wistfully. The life adventurous was so new a thing to him, and so thrilling, and this fresh, aspect of it was so tempting and he had fallen in love 
at first sight with the canary-colored cart and all its little fitments. The rat saw what was passing in his mind and wavered. He hated disappointing people and he was fond of the mole and would do almost anything to oblige him. Toad was watching them both closely. Come along in and have some lunch, he said diplomatically, and we'll talk it over. We needn't decide anything in a hurry, of course. I don't really care. I only want to give pleasure to you fellows. Live for others. That's my motto in life.